Well, good morning, everyone. <coughs> it's great to see you, but it's even greater to be able to see your smiling faces once again. <coughs> Three of masks. Well, I hope you're looking forward with anticipation to our time together this morning, even if you're having difficulties and distractions. And of course, many of us will be distracted today by what's happening overseas in Ukraine. Uh, some people might even be distressed about it. it uh, I guess we're all wondering just why it's happening and what on earth we can do about it, if anything. <clears throat> so I was intrigued that uh, I've been reading through the book of Psalms just lately and yesterday I came to Psalm 33 and I thought I'd read a few verses from the start of Psalm 33. <clears throat> Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skilfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. <coughs> that last paragraph reminds us that whatever's happening around the place in the world, that God's will will stand. It will prevail. Just... We might not understand what's happening or why it's happening, but in the end, God's will will prevail. And I think we need to take heart from that. We need to trust him. We need to trust that he's working his purposes out as time goes on. <clears throat> but the psalm primarily encourages us to praise the Lord, not just to praise him, but to praise with an enthusiasm that reflects his nature. Christians might be reflective and quiet, in their personal relationship with God as our Father. Yet he is also the, the Almighty who deserves strong acclaim. We don't have a lyre this morning. We don't have a 10-string harp. We've got a 12-string guitar, <coughs> which might suffice. But anyway, we'll make do. But yeah, it seems appropriate as we start this morning's service to join in joyful praise and our first song, Oh for a Thousand Tongues, seems to fit the bill quite well. This song takes a range of images from the Bible, primarily relating to the saving work of Jesus achieved through his dying on the cross and rising again to defeat death, bringing new light to those who believe. Most of you should be familiar with it, but I'll just remind you that in the chorus there's a, a lower part, which I'll be singing, and a higher part, which Robin will be singing. So I won't call it ladies and men or whatever, just follow whoever you want. And, uh, but yeah, sing out. We've got no masks, so it would be, be great if we can hear your voices loud and strong. So please stand and sing with us. Oh, oh, oh. 
the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. 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 He speaks and listening to his voice. New life the dead receive. You like the dead receive the mournful broken hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. The humble poor believe. The humble poor believe. I know Ron likes that key change, but I find <laughs> Jesus a bit high for me. <laughs> right, uh, Robin, if you could just flick the announcements. Yeah, Safe Church Sisman, just a reminder for those who are attending the workshop, it's on the 26th of March. See me for details. Now, you've probably noticed I'm talking because Stephen's away. He's up in Queensland this weekend. Um, and Jim's away, he's at Dubbo today. So Jim mentioned last Sunday that we we're having a church meeting next Sunday. So at this stage it's on, but we'll have to confirm that with Stephen and Jim when they get back, just to make sure it's still on. I'll be sending out some material to read, <clears throat> a couple of documents that are more than a page each, so it'd be great if when you get those links, if you could read that and be prepared for the meeting by reading the material. We won't have time to read it at the meeting, so we'll have to assume you've read it. For those who don't have emails, uh, see me after the service and I'll try and get you a hard copy. <coughs> Routine meetings, uh, as per usual, I don't think we need to repeat that. Don't forget face to face this afternoon at 4.30. Uh, the reading of the Bible is underway. What week are we? What? Week two. Week two. Right, so uh, if you haven't caught up with that, Ben's the one to talk to. Camp out. I don't think I need to say any more about that. Um, haven't seen a program or anything yet, so if you want to know more, you'll have to talk to Stephen. Uh, a few of us were up at Joy and Jessica's cafe recently when we went up to see Bob and Liz. Bob's still a bit crook. And we had uh, some coffee and some apple pie with ice cream. Very nice. And uh, so the ladies have decided to uh, head up there on the 24th of March, get there at 10am. If you're leaving from here, leave by 9.30. Uh, they'd like to let us know roughly how many are coming, so if you can let Janet know by the 21st of March, that's the Monday beforehand. Thank you. <coughs> well, Stephen's not here, but... Uh, when he's back, he'll be talking to more of us about ministry gifts, so uh, look forward to that. Now, with the disappearing of the COVID rules, we thought it was about time we started collecting the offering like we used to do. 
back in the good old days, <laughs> for those who can remember. Um, COVID's still around and other diseases, so we thought for those, if you've got any concerns at all, uh, don't forget to use hand sanitizer on your way out just in case you're worried about picking something up off the, the bags. So if we could uh, collect the offering now, please. Uh, our next song, one of the names for it is the Creed. I guess a fair few of you here will know what a creed is, but I just thought for those who might not, I'd say a couple of words. A, a, a creed is a set of beliefs, and, and this creed, or it's based on the Apostles' Creed, forms a distinctive sign for identify, <coughs> sorry, identification of Christians. It appears to have been first used around the third century, and the, the, the creed now called the Apostles' Creed, the words seem to have come about in about the 5th century. So it's been around for a while. It's a set of foundational beliefs of the Christian faith and it's been used across and still is used across many denominations. Um, Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian and a range of others. I should have written it down, I can't remember now. Uh, this song is a fair bit more recent. It came out in 2014. It reforms that creed into a modern musical setting, um, which might help freshen it up for people who haven't grown up with the creed as part of their church background. We sang it for the first time at the end of October. So some might not remember it. Hopefully there'll be enough so we can get some singing <laughs> rather than just us up the front. Um, even if you're not familiar with it, just it's not that hard. You just have to listen a bit for the tune. But certainly I hope the words resonate uh, with you. So please stand and sing it. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth, I believe in the saints' communion, and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection, when Jesus comes again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe. believe 
Jesus Christ he is Lord. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in god our father i believe in christ the son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. We don't have Susan, so we don't have kids' time. There we go. Well, let's go over the verse. The verse that Susan's been teaching us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 11. I uh, have the Bible reading now, thanks. Oh, which, which is the button to press? To that one? Okay, thank you. I'm that one that way. Okay, our Bible reading, Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would be not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And I will give our and we'll, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parth, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles and prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben. If I haven't met you before, I'm going to use a... Oh, I'm just going to divert that away because I've got two mics on. <coughs> now, I'm using a, an extra stand here because I'm really tall and I've got terrible eyesight. So <laughs> this one doesn't work for me down here. Um, Thanks for, uh, for our reading today. As I've been preparing for today, I don't know about you, but I've been quite distracted by events in Europe um, 
And there's something that, that kind of runs through a lot of the news that we're seeing, which is that people know that what is needed in Europe is not just words, but also actions. We, don't, we might not know what the appropriate words and the appropriate actions are. We all, everyone seems to disagree on, on, on the words and on the actions, but, but everyone does agree what we need is both word and action in the Ukraine at, at the moment. And words and actions are the theme of the chapter that we're looking at today in Acts chapter 6. And I'll just run us back to the start. Actually, I think we've got the... Uh, oh, I'll sit on here. Yeah, so they're, they're the theme of, of what we're looking at, at today. And... Um, Whatever the appropriate words and actions are for, for Ukraine today, there is a subversive message of words and actions which run underneath and through the political sphere, which thrive under the, the oppression of tyrants, which bring hope to those facing destruction and liberate people from darkness on an eternal scale. And that's why on Sunday mornings, we turn our attention from the words and actions of politicians to the word and actions of the creator of the universe. And we're not here to, to hear me rambling on about politics. We're here to grapple together with the word of the living God and to let those, th those words shape our thoughts and our feelings and our, our, our words and our actions. So let me pray before we start and, and look at the word together. Father God, as we study this little section of Acts, we pray that you would, you would open our hearts to see more of you. You would open our ears to hear your message for us, this, this church family in Kurijong. Lord, I pray that you would strip away any words that I say which, are, which obscure you or which are unhelpful, and that you would focus, focus our hearts and our minds onto your scripture and your message for us today. Amen. We're in a series called Devoted, and it's looking at uh, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and part of a church? Are we, are we simply committed to a religious, religious patterns of life, doing, doing the same things every week or every year? Or is there a, a deeper and more compelling call that drives our hearts to devotion? And, and what is that? And today I'm going to kick us off with a question that's kind of similar to that, which is, what are we expecting the church to be? And I wonder if you've been following this, this series over the last few weeks and the one we had before Christmas, have you been wondering whether our previous expectations of what the church is or what the church can be were too small? Where are our expectations of church too small? Is it a good environment to um, bring up moral kids? Is it a community where we, we, we sing songs together on a Sunday morning? A place to learn scripture, to pray together, to grow disciples of Jesus? Well, it probably is all those things. Um, but something else shines through in this little chapter little section of Acts chapter 6 that we, we're going to look at today. And it's something that should be making us look for more, making us ask for more about what church is and how it can impact the world. Whether we're going through next door for a cup of tea after the service, or whether we're facing um, terror and destruction, or false accusations and death, like they are in the, in the Ukraine. And false accusations and death were the context of what we're reading in Acts as well. In, in Acts chapter 7, the next chapter after this, one of the people that's introduced here faces false accusations and, and death. So it's the context for this church as well as it is for, for the church in, in Ukraine today. And my hope for today from, from this little 15-minute talk or so is that we will leave church with our eyes a little bit wider as to what church can be in the community. And, and I hope that we'll leave acutely aware of our need for the Spirit of God to be moving in us as individuals and as a church family. So my summary for the talk today, which I'm going to give you a summary first, and then we'll look through the passage, and we'll come back to the summary at the end. 
Summary is this. For words and action, we have normal people in the church sharing the good news of God's compassion and power. Living out that good news with practical actions, practical compassion and demonstrations of power, fueled by the Spirit of God. So this is my summary for, for today. There's nothing special about this diagram, it's just my attempt to, to summarise this particular section of Acts chapter 6. And we'll come back to that uh, as, as we go through. First, we'll dive into Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And we parachute into the early church at a time when they are having a problem. There's, there are these uh, Hellenistic Jews among the church who are complaining about the Hebraic Jews. That's basically uh, kind of Greek culture Jewish Christians um, who are complaining about classic Jewish culture um, Christians in the church. So it's all inside the church. There are two different cultural groups that are struggling to, to get on. And they're their complaint is about the daily distribution of food. It's a little bit like today how we might, have, uh, we might have a service with two congregations, a modern and a traditional congregation, and you've got the modern congregation, these Hellenists, complaining that the traditional guys are taking all the biscuits from the church cupboard. <laughs> <coughs> but this one was probably a little bit more legitimate, but biscuits are quite important, so... Yeah, so there's a problem in, in the early church when we join them. I want to do a quick, quick vote here. Uh, do we expect um, there to be more... Uh, who thinks churches complain most when they are either growing or when they've lost their direction? So a quick vote. Who thinks churches complain most when they're growing? Yeah, we've got one. Who thinks churches complain most when they've lost their direction? Yeah, quite a lot. Well, there's no right or wrong answers. But in this case... This church was growing. Actually, this church was thriving. You can see it here at the beginning of verse 1. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. It's, kind of, it's interesting. I was surprised by this. We've got a growing church with, with, um, with struggles happening. So in this case, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay's on, on the money. Um, there was an undercurrent of discontent in the church, despite the fact that it was, it was a growing church, um, it, you could say it was thriving from a lot of the other things that we see in Acts. And, there, and it's full of people who are full of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that in, in verse 3 when we get to it in a minute. So we've got this, it's a great church, but it's facing problems. And there's, pe- there's groups, there's division, there's, there's grumbling against one another. So it's, this is a little bit of an aside for this, this talk, but it's here in the passage. And I, I thought I'd ask the question, do we expect church to be perfect? You know, and if it's not perfect, we'll go and find another one. We're a family of rescued sinners, and we need to bear with one another as we work out our, our solutions to our, our problems. And that's, the church has never been perfect. And, um, you know, all the more reason for us to love each other. And in this case, I think that both groups were probably right, just in different ways. The, the Hellenistic Jews, the Greeks, they were probably right in, in, in the facts. They probably were being discriminated against because at this time a lot of the, the main leaders were from the more classic Jewish um, culture. So they were right in their facts. But the Hebraic Jews, they were probably right in their hearts. They hadn't intentionally been um, discriminating against this other cultural group inside the church. So both were right, one in their facts and one in their hearts. And that's really common for, for um, disagreements in churches today, and not just churches, but generally. It's, it's really common that our gripes with each other are set off by unintentional wrongs. And, and it's something that's it's worth us just being aware of as we, as we deal with any difficulties in, in the church. That often it's, it's unintentional, and then it can set us off on a path of, of um, feeling like we're, we're more divided than we are. So the church has never been perfect. That's the main, main point I take from verse 1. Church has never been perfect, but it is Jesus' hands and feet in the world. So we've got an imperfect group of people who are Jesus' hands and feet in the world. And we're going to read um, verses 2 to 4 again. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. 
Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This passage is sometimes used to justify a view that preaching and teaching is super important and um, looking after widows and practical stuff, which the apostles call waiting on tables, is not important. Uh, but it's an odd, that's an odd interpretation. I don't think it's right. Because what this bit doesn't say is we're going to have to stop waiting on tables to prioritise the word and prayer. It doesn't say that. It says there's a responsibility here to be looking after these people and we're not doing, <laughs> we need to hand it over to someone else. I actually think you know, the, the apostles had clearly been trying to look after the daily distribution of food and to teach the word and to pray. And maybe they just they weren't as good at doing this thing as doing their primary calling, which was preaching and, and prayer. So in, in verse 3, you can see here there's a, there's a responsibility to look after the needy in the church. And they're not saying it's not a priority. They're handing it to people who can focus on it and do a great job. Waiting on tables, caring properly for the, that, that grumbling group of widows, was a critical part of church life. And there should be no surprise for us there. Because that's how Jesus acted when, when he was walking among them and teaching his disciples. Jesus spoke boldly about the compassion and power of God while caring for the lost and healing the sick. And actually his actions to, to, to care for the lost and heal, and, and heal the sick, they demonstrate the compassion and the power that he's talking about. And the two go hand in hand. And the apostles had initially been doing, doing the same. There's, there's lots of stories. You might know uh, a good example of um, when the apostles um, uh, pray for a, a lame man and he's healed and, and they go, they're off to teach in the synagogue. So there's lots of... The apostles have been doing, as Jesus did, they've been teaching and caring and healing and all of these things. But then in this part here, in this little bit of Acts, we see them kind of realising that it isn't just the leadership of the church that are Jesus' hands and feet. It's the whole church family that represents Jesus in their community. So it isn't just the leaders that have to try and mimic Jesus. But as a church, as a whole, they, they, they can fulfil Jesus' acts of teaching and, and prayer and, um, and care ministries. <clears throat> and that's reflected in various other areas of the New Testament. There's, for example, I'll just quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to 13. Paul says, just as, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, Hellenistic Jews or Hebraic Jews, slave or free. So there's this realisation going on in the church in Acts that actually it's the whole church that represents Jesus to the community. Both practical service and the ministry of the word and prayer, which you can see here in verse 4, Practical service and ministry of the word and prayer are essential responsibilities of the church. We're Jesus' hands and feet in the world, and like Jesus, our practical actions, our practical care, demonstrates and reinforces the, the good news that we speak of. It's actually bigger than that. It's not just a demonstration. When we, when we do practical care, practical service, it's an opportunity for the Spirit of God to, to move in miraculous ways. And I think this is where it's quite common for, for our expectation of the church to fall short of God's expectation for the church. It's in where we expect the, the, the Spirit of God to work through the normal actions of our, of our church in our lives and in the lives of the community around us. Because practical care is a spiritual ministry, or at least it's certainly an opportunity for spiritual ministry. When was the last time 
you saw someone commissioned for the, the preparation of morning tea by the laying on of hands uh, and prayer at the front of church. <clears throat> or, or Ron, in his role of looking after the church finances, lay, laying on of hands of the church getting together. And it's, it's funny, but that is actually what's happening in, at this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Also, these other people, I apologise for how difficult <laughs> to pronounce it were. Um, <clears throat> they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So what's happening here, there's a group of seven people from the church, just normal folks from the church, who are being commissioned to look after uh, widows and the distribution of food in the church. And they are, they're being prayed for and having their hands laid on them. Commissioned by laying on of hands. And I, I can't help but wonder if until we're used to a similar level of commissioning for our people in practical ministries, we probably haven't grasped the full significance of what those practical ministries are in terms of spiritual opportunities, opportunities for the, the power of God to be working through us and in our community. Caring for these widows called for people who were known to be full of the Spirit. It says that twice, actually. The first one in verse 3, here, where it says, choose, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And then when they pick the people, they call out Stephen particularly, who comes up again throughout the, the next few chapters of Acts, and say, he is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's called out twice that these people who are looking after widows need, needed to be full of the Spirit of God and of wisdom. They need this to fully carry out their responsibilities to the, the maximum. Now probably the church could have picked people who were, didn't particularly care about whether they were full of the Spirit or not. And they probably could have done a, a reasonable job of looking after the widows. But it would have been a missed opportunity because although it could have been done in a, in a kind of a normal, practical way, the, the leaders here seem to have realised that there's an opportunity here for the Spirit of God to work through practical service. And they wanted that, so they said, pick people who, who are full of the Spirit, or known to be full of the Spirit of God. Practical care is an opportunity for the Spirit to work in us and in our community. And to put it another way, if we want to see God move most powerfully in Karajong and Bilpin and, and the area around here, then we need his spirit at work in our practical care um, for each other and for the community. We can, we can do stuff on our own, but if we want to see God really move, we need him to be working through us. And God worked, worked powerfully through, through Stephen. And actually, the next verse after chapter 7, which we didn't read, is they, they, they say explicitly that. It says this, verse 8 of chapter 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. And Stephen and the others who were chosen to manage the distribution of food in the church, they were just normal people like, like you and me. They weren't, um, they weren't apostles, they hadn't been um, following Jesus and they hadn't been directly commissioned by Jesus. They hadn't done some, some special, special training or anything. They were normal people like, like you and me from the church congregation um, who had the spirit of God living in them. So the church is a place where normal people like you and me are appointed to care for a discontented bunch of widows and, and become spirit-filled men and women full of grace and power doing great wonders and signs among the people. That's, that's the church. And I'm just going to do a little aside here on what it means to be full of the spirit. Um, and I'm not, going to, I, I'm not going to answer the question, um, but I will just say two points about it. The first one is that actually if we've welcomed Jesus into our lives as Lord, 
then his spirit lives in us. That's one of the amazing things about following Jesus, in that he actually puts in his, his, a new spirit into us. And that, that comes from all over the New Testament. I don't want to go into it, and I don't fully understand it. Um, but Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 says, says this. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Just one example of the New Testament being very clear. All Christians, everyone who a follower of Jesus, who's committed their lives to Jesus, has the spirit living in them. And in so, in some ways, is full of the Spirit. But there does seem to be, it does seem to be possible for us to ignore it or cover it up, or get a bit lazy um, in looking, in giving opportunities for the Spirit to, to work in our hearts. Um, or on the flip side, there's an opportunity for us to ask for more and to fan it into flame. And there's different language like that ar around in the, in the New Testament. And this guy Stephen, who we've been reading about, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, um, is a good example of that. A normal person who, who seems to have been just asking for more of the Spirit in his life, looking to see the, the Spirit of God working in his life. So, uh, so the question is open to us. How much do we ask for God to fill us to overflowing with the Spirit as normal, normal members of a congregation doing normal things in our community. Our practical care is, is spiritual work. It's an opportunity for spiritual work. And if we're followers of Jesus, then our actions in serving tea or repairing a cupboard or um, sitting with someone in their grief, they are demonstrations of the power of God. And more than that, they're an opportunity for the Spirit of God to move in in power in, in us and in our community. And they turn people's ears to hear the good news of, of Jesus and God's rescue of, of us from darkness. And the church in Acts, after they'd been dealing with this, uh, this problem, um, they did that. They combined people to, to teach the word and pray and people to, to take practical service really seriously, and their church continued to thrive. Verse 7, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the church shared out responsibilities to make sure that both words and actions happened, and they knew that both needed the Spirit of God to be maximally effective and they were right. And the church saw more and more people restored to, to God. And through our series on, on Devoted, Stephen, our Stephen in Currajong, has been asking the question, how is our church good news in Currajong? How, and how can we, as, as uh, people in the church, be good news to, to Currajong? Now, we might be only capable of simple things and relatively small efforts but we know the one who is in the business of rescuing people from slavery to darkness and transferring them into the kingdom of light and Stephen, our Stephen preaches that good news of God who is rescuing people from darkness and restoring them to the kingdom of light, he preaches that week in, week out, on a Sunday. And we can talk about that uh, at, over the fence or at, at the local shop or at the school gate. We can talk about it too. But like Jesus, our practical actions are an opportunity for the Spirit to demonstrate that compassion and power that, that Stephen is preaching about on a Sunday, that we might be talking about when we meet someone for coffee. So let's be praying earnestly that the Spirit of God would fill us to overflowing as we go about those things. Let's, let's just ask for that. So what are we doing being part of a church? Are, are our expectations for what the church can be too small? Well, I think if our expectations don't include ordinary people 
in the congregation, being full of God's grace and power, sharing the good news, demonstrating it practically, then they are probably too small. With Jesus, our practical care is an opportunity for the Spirit of God to, to demonstrate and convey the compassion and power that we speak about at church on a Sunday or, or elsewhere. Our practical service is a spiritual ministry. Or it's an opportunity for the Spirit to work through normal followers of Jesus like you and me. And it might look completely different for each of us. The way that uh, you might show compassion and demonstrate the, the power of God and the way the Spirit might work through you in other people might look completely different to how it does for me or someone else. But, and that's a great thing. Because together, as a whole church, we represent Jesus in this, in this community. And that's what this church in Acts realised as they struggled to, to manage the distribution of food. This church, the early church, they combined the apostles' devotion to uh, preaching, teaching and praying with the devotion of, of seven members of, of their spirit-filled, um, to spirit-filled practical service and the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So let's pray for a pouring out of the Spirit of God in, in our peaceful church here in Karajong, in us, in, our, in individuals, in this community. And we'll also pray for our brothers and sisters in the church in Ukraine who are in a, a wildly different situation, but um, we know that the Spirit of God works, work, can work powerfully through them. So we'll pray together. Father God, uh, we, don't, we don't know why you choose to put your Spirit in us and to use simple people, uh, sinners, to show your compassion and to convey your, your power in our community. We don't know why, Lord, but we are, are thankful that you choose to use us to show your love to, to each other and to our community here in Karajong. And Lord, we pray that you would pour your spirit out on, on us as a church, on the other Christians who are living and, and um, going about their practical service here in Karajong. Lord, we pray that you would help us to lift our expectations for um, what you want to, to see and do through this church. That you would make each of us more expectant to see you, you working in our lives and um, using us to serve one another in love and, and care. And we pray, Lord, also that you, would, that you would help us to be thankful for the diversity in the church. Um, that that uh, you would make us really appreciative of the different ways which you, you work through different people here um, as, we, as we together, as a community, represent you in, in this um, village of Karajong and, and Bilpin and surrounds. And Lord, in our prayer session just coming up, we're going to pray a bit more for, for the church in Ukraine and for the situation there. But Lord, we, we just pray quickly now that, that you would pour out your spirit on Christians in Ukraine, that they might be able to support the, uh, the people um, who they're living with and suffering with over there. Amen. Amen. This song seems to follow on nicely from what Ben's been talking about. It's a prayer to our Lord that as we listen to him, he would fashion us to be fit for his purposes and that our lives would increasingly reflect his love and his power. I hope it's your prayer as we sing, so please stand. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us 
in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let the truth prevail over us. Trust the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And my grace will stand on your promises, and my faith will walk as you walk. O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Hi everyone, um, my name is Mary, if I haven't met you before, uh, we're going to spend some time now talking to God, so uh, feel free to bow your heads and we'll pray together. Father God, we pray for our church family who serve in practical ministries, who care for folks in nursing homes, who serve food to us each week, who meet up with community members in times of trouble, and do so, so many other things in our church, Lord, and on this mountain. Lord, we need your spirit to be at work in our practical care and in our community. Please make these practical carers full of your spirit, full of your grace and your power, and make their actions full of your spirit. May you be at work through these ministries, we ask. We bring before you the missionaries that we support as a church. Lippius and Elvi, Jim and Di, Matt and Shannon, and Deb and Rob. Lord, we thank you that we can be part of your work across the world through these partners. We thank you for the messages we've received about the amazing work that you're doing through them. We pray that you would continue the spread of the gospel in the places where they are working, that more people would know you and that they would know you more deeply. We pray for any personal difficulties that our mission partners may, mission partners may be facing at the moment. Isolation, danger, spiritual lows, finance and family troubles. Whatever it may be, Lord, we ask that these difficulties would be alleviated and that they would see your hand at work in their lives. Lord, we bring before you the invasion of Ukraine. We pray for the government and people of Ukraine, the people of Russia who live under an authoritarian regime, for the leaders of the world, that they will respond with wisdom and courage and for the restraint of evil and the restoration of peace with justice. In your word, Lord, in Psalm 10, it says, Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God, do not forget the helpless. And so we ask, Sovereign Lord, you observe all those who dwell on earth. 
Have mercy, we pray, on those who now suffer the miseries of a war, not of their own making. Have compassion on the wounded and dying. Comfort the brokenhearted. Confound the hatred and madness of those who make war. Guide our rulers, bring war to an end, and bring peace across the world. Unite us all under the reign of your Son, the Prince of Peace, before whose judgment seat the rulers of the world will give an account, and whose, in whose name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Our last song today is Bless the Lord, O My Soul, or 10,000 Reasons. It's another song echoing our desire to praise and worship our Lord despite the challenges which might beset us, despite what's happening in the world around us. And just like the first song we sang this morning, the idea is that our song would be wholehearted and passionate. So I hope you can sing with some passion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Please stand. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons of my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end was near and my time has come Then still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy Well, that's it for the formal part of the service, if you can call this formal, I suppose. But <laughs> uh, so please hang around for morning tea if you can. That'd be great to have a chat.